involved with the activities and continued reunions of the of the rangers who this group that was very uh, <coughs> instrumental in, in securing the beachhead and uh, he and, and a number of people go back for reunions to visit and you can see the number of the rangers who didn't make it the first couple of days but uh, I'll let Sidney tell us the rest <clears throat> well, thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure meeting you, and also Alan Bickle and Alex and Joel. Got to put my glasses on so I can read my notes. Is that working now, uh, Alex? And some friends of mine surprised me by dropping in just a little while ago and embarrassed the heck out of me. <laughs> so this has to be good today, tonight. It is great to see a turnout like this on the subject of World War II. Because in times of years gone by, World War II could almost be termed ancient history. Because of my participation in the war, my grandsons have always been a standout in their history class and are usually the only ones in that class who can name the date of the Normandy invasion. As all of you know, the invasion was 6th June 1944. Over the years, I have taken two grandsons to Normandy. And at the time, one was nine years old and the other was 10 years old. This year I shall be going and taking another uh, grandson who's a senior in high school. My oldest daughter has accompanied me on two occasions and one of my sons has been over there. If you saw the picture, Saving Private Ryan, then you know a little bit about the landings as the first 12, 14, 15 minutes of that film was the Hollywood version of the invasion and I might add was quite graphic. Now, after the landing sequence of that film, Tom Hanks, the star of the film, reported to a colonel, properly saluting and saying, Captain Miller, C Company, Second Rangers. Well, my name is Sid Salomon, and on 6 June 1944, I was the first lieutenant in C Company, Second Ranger Battalion. During World War II, there were, there were two platoons in a ranger company. And a ranger company consisted of 65 men and three officers. As compared to a rifle company in a division, that had approximately 200 men and six officers. Well, I command, commanded the second platoon of C Company, Bill Moody, my fellow platoon leader commanded the first platoon, and Ralph Gornson was the company commander. On that day in my landing craft, there were 37 men. After we crossed the beach and climbed the cliff and reached the top, I had nine men. Only two of them had not been wounded. The rest of the platoon had been either killed were so seriously wounded that they're unable to make the cliff. Now as a background of the second range of battalion, it was activated around the end of April, the latter part of April in 1943 in Camp Forest, Tennessee. All members of a ranger battalion were volunteers. At the beginning, there were a succession of battalion commanders until the arrival of Major Rudder in June, and he whipped the battalion into shape. The fact that he had been a football coach in Texas prior to joining the Army may have had something to do with the success in organizing us into a unit. For the next several weeks, an intensive training program was in effect to round out everything, everyone in a top physical condition prepare everyone for combat action. 
and reducing the number of officers and enlisted personnel to prescribed table of organization numbers. A succession of training areas followed, including the area around Camp Forest, the Navy Scouts and Raiders School in Florida, then some time in Fort Dixon, New Jersey, and after that a brief stay at Camp Kilmer, uh, excuse me, at Camp uh, Shanks in New York State, then aboard the HMS Queen Elizabeth for Scotland. When we arrived in Scotland, then it was an overnight troop train movement to the southeast coast of Cornwall, England, which is on the Atlantic Ocean side of England. We moved four or five times while in uh, England, always in the south, southeast, and southwest part of the country, including the Isle of Wight. Each time we stayed put for a short while, the cliffs on which we were practiced climbing seemed to be getting a little bit higher than the previous cliff. We still had no idea as to when the invasion would take place or what part, if any, we would have. Finally, we moved into what was termed a marshalling area, where all the troops that were to be part of the invasion, invading forces, were in camp. Now we knew what was ahead of us. Then came the day when we marched, finally marched through the streets of uh, Weymouth in England to the dock area and boarded the HMS Prince Charles. Bear in mind, the original date of the invasion was to be the 5th of June, but stormy weather and rough water postponed the actual invasion for a minimum of 24 hours. Meanwhile, we sat aboard the ship somewhere in the English Channel. The next day, although the water was still rough, word came down from General Eisenhower with the word, go, for the morning of the 6th. Around 3.30 in the morning, we were awakened and had breakfast, at least those of us who, could, who were able to eat, and ultimately made our way to the boat deck. The ship rocked from side to side in the rough waters, as did the landing craft as they rolled in the davits. It was dark as we walked across a plank that had been placed on the railing of the uh, Prince Charles over to the landing craft. The British seamen, who were standing by the railing, were lending their arm as we walked the plank, almost like a pirate's. The crew lowered the landing craft, were smacked at the bottom of the, uh, which smacked the bottom of the sea in the landing craft into the, as it hit the churning water. C Company had two landing craft, one for each platoon. We circled momentarily until both were parallel and in position, then off we headed side by side for the approximately 10 to 12 miles to the shores of France. H hour was to be 0630, and if everything went right, we would be on target. The mission of C Company was a separate one. We went in alone. The other two Ranger companies, A and B, who were also on the Prince Charles, would not start out for another half to three quarters of an hour. Their objective was with the main invasion force to land on the beach in front of the town of Vierville. And they too were probably getting ready to launch their landing craft. The other three companies of the battalion, D, E, and F Company, were getting ready to launch their landing craft as they were headed for point, what we call Point de Hoc. As it so happened, due to navigational errors, they went off course and were 30 minutes late arriving at their landing site. As our landing craft bounced through the choppy waters of the channel, the dawn slowly came up. Each man had been issued a brown paper bag, and some used it during that run into the shore. As we approached the shore, concentric circles landed around the, around the craft. They were enemy mortar and or artillery shells being fired at us by the enemy on 
ahead of us on the uh, shore. Also, the ping of small arms fire as the bullets hit the sides of the steel hull craft. Now it was daylight, and we were visible to the German defenders who were on top of the cliff. Well, there were still some five to eight minutes prior to touchdown, off to the right, we saw one of the new secret projects of the US, a barge with several rows of rocket launchers. The barge was lining up parallel to the beach. Then with a swoosh and a lot of flames, all the rockets were fired, headed to the shore. We all peered over the side of the landing craft to watch the, to watch the result. What a letdown. The rockets never made it to the shore. They all made a large splash, not quite reaching the shore, the water's edge. Within a short while, it was time to stand and prepare for touchdown. The English sub-lieutenant called out, go, and yanked the rope to let down the ramp. I jumped, I op pulled open the steel door and jumped off the ramp to the right. The second man, Sergeant Reed, jumped to the left, then the others alternately right and left as we had practiced. The tide was incoming. In addition, the craft was lighter as each man jumped off the, off the ramp. It only took seconds for me to regain my feet and balance. I was just over waist deep in the water and I noticed that Sergeant Reed had been hit by small arms fire just as he jumped off the ramp. He collapsed and was underneath the ramp. I reached over, grabbed him by the collar, and pulled him from under the ramp just before he would have been steamrolled. I dragged him along the surf and up on the sand, saying that the aid man would be come along to take care of him, that I had to uh, continue on our mission. Another several yards further, and a mortar shell landed right behind me, killing and or wounded all the men in my mortar section and, and knocking me flat on my face. I thought that I was dead until feeling sand being kicked up in my face, then realized that a German machine gunner must be getting me in, my, in his sights. I jumped up and ran the rest of the way to the base of the cliff. The aid man came running over to me. I removed my jacket and shirt. The aid man picked out several pieces of shrapnel out of my back, patched me up, and said that's all he could do for me now. A couple of men had already started to climb the cliff, as we had previously practiced. Then it was my turn, and I started up on top. On top, I looked around and counted how many men had made the top side, and there were nine of us. Meanwhile, the American destroyers, Harding and Satterley, were steaming up and down just offshore. All of a sudden, one of the destroyers fired a couple of 40 millimeter shells towards us. Fortunately, they missed, but the concussion from the shells lifted us all almost a foot off the ground. We had all been laying prone on the ground. I pulled out the orange recognition panel from my jacket and displayed that. The fire, which was a, a, a recognition panel, and the firing stopped. Later we learned that they figured it was not possible for anyone to have made it up the cliff, hence the firing. Lieutenant Bill Moody and the men who were left in his platoon went to our left where there was fortified house according to intelligence report. They neutralized that within a short time. Meanwhile, I had spotted a trench directly ahead of me that ran perpendicular from the house at the edge of the cliff inland. I was lying in a large shell hole, contemplating my next move. And just then, Bill Moody came running from behind, jumped in the shell hole to my right, just as I pointed out the trench to him, he collapsed onto my right side. He had been instantly killed by a German sniper. 
I called to one of my men who was nearby, Otto Stevens, and together we ran across the open ground and jumped into the trench. As we slowly worked our way through the trench, I noted the opening of a dugout ahead, and taking a white phosphorus grenade from my belt, I arched it into the dugout. We waited several moments, then ran to the opening with my Tommy gun at the ready and let go a couple of shots. All cleared, then we went for on further up the trench. Next we came across a built-in mortar position, all calibrated with targets and the yardage printed on the walls of the position. The gun was not manned, so we destroyed it. As we rounded a curve in the trench, a German soldier was coming from the opposite direction. Apparently, I recovered first as we grabbed him as a prisoner, hoping to get some information from him. We sent him to the base of the cliff where the CO was helping the aid man care for the casualties. We decided it would be best to maintain possession of this ground rather than forge ahead with so few men left. Therefore, for the balance of the day, we just held our ground and took care of any Germans that were retreating from the beach in front of the town of Vierville. In the meantime, the CO had sent a couple of the lightly wounded men up the beach towards the town of Vierville, which was several hundred yards away in an attempt to make contact with our A and B companies who had landed there. They did make contact with the B Company commander, and arrangements were made to join up with them on the following morning on a blacktop road about a half a mile inland that paralleled the coastline. The next morning when we met, we learned that of A and B Company, only one officer was left. The others were either killed or severely wounded. All three companies then combined, but did not even make up a full company. But we joined forces and headed up the road to join our other three companies at Point de Hoc, which is approximately five miles distant. It took the better part of a day to fight our way up that distance, but eventually we hooked up with our D, E, and F companies and the battalion CO who had landed with them. Two days in that area, then we moved to a secured area and were put on a reserve status. The war had bypassed us as we waited for replacements to bring us up to strength. The B Company commander was elevated to a battalion staff position, and I was promoted to captain, assuming command of B Company. Now this chart I have right over here Uh, where have I got that with the figures here? Oh, well, now there's another one. Oh, on the bullet board, okay. I knew I had it. That's all right, just like that is enough, Joe. On that, uh, that's a list that I made up from the official KIAs. That's killed in action. It does not take care of the wounded. That only, that's by company. Now, I had to use the dates from June 6th to June 8th for one reason, because the three companies who landed at DENF and Len Lamel, my good friend, was here last fall, and he was in D Company of that, on that mission. Well, from that chart, you can see that DENF had the easiest mission. On A, B, and C, all those KIAs were within the first hour of June 6th. D, E, and F, their KIAs came over a, from June 6th to June 8th. Otherwise, I would have just had June 6th, and theirs would have looked too few to make it uh, look as if they hadn't done anything. But uh, that is just killed and wounded on one day, and as I say, three companies, A, B, and C. Well, almost twice as many for the three companies of A, B, and C as there is for D and F companies. Now that is only for one day. That is not the killed. 
in my company at the end of the war, I had over 200 percent turnover from killed. You might question the detailed part of the description of what I did almost 55 years ago. Very little problem about that for a couple of reasons. Some 20 years ago, shortly after my wife died, I decided to embark upon a project of writing an article about that day and about my platoon. I sent it to a couple of magazines, and lo and behold, one accepted it and sent me a check. Also, 20 years ago, I decided to make a trip to Normandy, a pilgrimage, pilgrimage if it might be termed that way. At the time, I was national president of the Ranger Battalions Association, so it was a fitting time. Since then, I have returned every five years, always taking a member of my family. As I said earlier, this will be no exception, as I shall have a grandson accompany me, a high school senior. Also, outside of my wedding day, the 6th of June is an important day in my life. A group of fellow rangers and myself have been getting together on that day for many years. The Lamels are the only ones left from that group, from that original group. But as some have died, we have managed to pick up a few others as they moved into this tri-state area, which means New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. Last year, on June 6, we were down to three of us. Due to the publicity, Accorded to the 50th anniversary of the Normandy invasion in 1994, we were able to see a renewed interest in World War II. We now see a further renewed interest from a younger age group because of the film Saving Private Ryan. Certain happenings on that day most definitely are etched in my mind. Combat is an experience that does not occur on a daily basis. The combat experience with the 2nd Ranger Battalion only lasted not quite 12 months, from the 6th of June, the date of the invasion, to the 8th of May, the date of the surrender. At that time, we were fighting on the outskirts of Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. That includes a combat trail, <coughs> excuse me, and I might use it as this way, side trips up the Cherbourg Peninsula, then up the Brittany Peninsula, across France, part of Belgium, also Luxembourg, across Germany, and into Czechoslovakia. A real lesson in geography and a long walk. Some of the battle situations were really standouts. Besides the invasion, I can name the Hurkan Forest what we term Hill 400, which is in Germany, just prior to getting to the uh, Rhine River, fording the icy Rohr River, the town of Altnar, which is just 20 miles this side of the uh, Rhine River, just prior to the Remagen Bridge. Experiences that we endured served to bind us together. I still correspond with my men who are scattered over the U.S although our numbers are dwindling. A Ranger Battalion Association was formed in 1949. There were only six Ranger Battalions during World War II. When you consider a Ranger Battalion consisted of approximately 500 men, that is rather a unique and elite group out of an army of some nine, ten million men, and rangers were all volunteers. Three of the ranger company the battalions fought in Africa, Sicily, and Italy, but they were disbanded after the Battle of Anzio and Cisterno. A sixth ranger battalion was formed late in 1944, and they saw they were in, in the Pacific Theater, but they saw limited action during the last six months of the war, primarily in the Philippines. The 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions 
were both formed in the U.S. in 1943. We were shipped to England and Scotland for further training, and both entered combat with the Normandy invasion and fighting our way across Europe until the war came to a close. Both battalions were disbanded upon reaching the U.S. in October and November of 1945. It would be 1974 until the Rangers were once again activated because of the world situation and the changes that had taken place throughout the world. Large-scale wars were replaced by small action and hot spots in several places throughout the globe. The Rangers continue to be a part of our military to this day. I, for one, have been proud to have been a Ranger. Now, before bringing this to a close and going over my charts and maps that I have here, allow me to digress for a few minutes to explain some of our training experiences while in England as a change from combat activity. An advanced party of two men, an officer and an enlisted man, had preceded the battalion to Europe in order to arrange training sites and living accommodations. Just prior to landing in Scotland on the Queen Elizabeth, an outbreak of the flu broke out aboard the ship. Imagine approximately 16,000 men aboard that ship and men were dropping right and left. The ship's hospital was overflowing. Men were on cuts in the passageways. Since the ship was too large to tie up at a dock, it anchored in the bay and personnel were unloaded and brought to the pier by barges. The hospital cases were strapped to a gurney and lifted by crane from the ship to a barge, taken ashore, and then transported to a military hospi hospital in Glasgow. Since a company CO, Ralph Gornson, was one of the afflicted, I was put in charge of the company. Our troop train ride from Scotland to Cornwall was an overnight journey, but of course we didn't know what our destination was nor where we were going. Upon our arrival at our destination, the following morning, we learned that we were in the town of Bude in Cornwall. There the advance party met us at the train station and gave each company commander a map of the town with some street names and numbers written on it. And the numbers with a designation of one, two, and three after it, meaning the personnel of that house would be able to take care of that many men. We marched through town, marched the company to the first street on the map, and at the corner I stopped, and I noted the numbers. For example, I live in Doylestown at 27 Birchwood Drive. I would stop in front of the number of that house, 27, turn around and look at the company and call out, okay, Smith and Jones, go up to the front door and introduce yourself. That is where you're going to live. Then we go to the next number, until all the company have been assigned to a house. Can you imagine yourself here in the U.S. having a soldier or two from a foreign country living in your home? When my two sons and two daughters were small and growing up, I would explain that to them with an explanation that one of the reasons for a Revolutionary War was that in the Boston area, the colonists, colonists were forced to accept British troops in their homes. In World War II, the English people volunteered and were paid a fee by the United States government. We only lived with the people in view. We did not eat with them. In the center of town, the battalion took over a public garage and we use that as a kitchen and mess hall. Since 65 men in each company were scattered over several blocks in town, we arranged to meet at a designated corner, equidistant to where the men were quartered. 
It must have been quite a sight as we met at the meeting site with our mess gear, then marched as a company to the mess hall, which is about a mile away. Another time, we were quartered on the Isle of Wight. Now there are only two companies on the Isle of Wight and in the town of Sandown. This is a resort area with a number of small hotels and boarding houses. But it was wartime, so there were not any vacationers there. Plus, it was February, and positioned in the English Channel, just off the city of Southampton and Portsmouth, along the route of the German bombers as they made their way to bomb London. There we lived and ate with the English people, usually in a boarding house or a hotel, as more men could, be, could live at one establishment rather than a private home. Since food in England at that time was being rationed, and ration cards were required, we were issued what was termed a commando ration card. That was equivalent to two cards, and we handed that to the person where we lived. Therefore, the owner had more purchasing power with the additional ration cards, and they ate better. We, on, we were only there about five weeks, but we trained hard, night and day. The cliffs were higher from any others that we had ever climbed, a great, and it was a great experience for all of us. And we had an idea what might be ahead of us. But this was such an experience for us. No matter whether we were city boys at home, or from a farm, or from Appalachia, or from some cot southern cotton town, later when it was over, a cynical feeling crept into our thinking. Some of our men paid with their life for that kind of training. Now, I might add, when we walked up to that house, at first in Bude, and then later on over in Sandown, every man had his weapon on his shoulder and a bandolier of uh, ammunition. So can you imagine here in this country today having a foreign soldier in your house with his rifle and a band of ammunition. Now on the Isle of Wight, where we're eating with the English people, remember they don't eat until at least 8 o'clock at night. In the Army, boy, 6 o'clock, we're ready to eat. That goes way back from basic training. So we arranged a, uh, an agreement with the uh, owner of the hotel where there were uh, seven officers living at that hotel. And the woman who owned it was taking, took care of the hotel while her husband was an officer and away at sea in the British Navy. And we arranged a, she couldn't come down at 6 o'clock because they don't eat until 8. So we arranged a medium. We said, OK, 7 o'clock. Well, when we were climbing the cliffs, which are right out the back door of the hotel, at 4 o'clock, just as it does today in England, Everything stops. And since we weren't going to eat until 7 o'clock, training for the war stopped too. We took our uh, rifles, slung it over our shoulder, walked in the town to the nearest tea shop, and we had tea and scones. Then it was too late, so we might as well go back to where we lived. Well, now, look, let me go back. Let me go over some of these charts. The large one on the bulletin board there is a breakdown of the entire Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, the British sector, and the Canadian sector. And it all goes all the way up from General Eisenhower at the top. And Utah Beach is over to the right on the Cherbourg Peninsula. They call it the Cotentin Peninsula, but we call it the Cherbourg Peninsula. <clears throat> and the, uh, the landing areas are all along there. Here also is one, and it might be difficult for you, particularly in the rear, to see this, but uh, I'll leave them up a while and you can come and look at them. And this shows you uh, one division, the fourth division was over at Utah Beach. Omaha Beach was the, uh, the larger of the two beaches. The 29th Division 
in the first division, plus all attached troops. And we were attached at that time with the 29th Division. <coughs> During our year in combat, because we were a small, independent battalion, we would be attached to, as I remember, either eight or nine different divisions, whether it be an infantry division, a cavalry squadron, or an armored division. And since so little was known about the Rangers in World War II, even among the top brass in the Army, when we'd be attached to a division, I, this is my guess, and I'm sure the division commander said, oh boy, we have, the, we have the Rangers with us. Let's put them in front and keep our own statistics down. And I guess that's what happened. Well, that may be cynical, but I'm sure it has a, a little uh, modem of truth. Here is a map that I had made Oh, 40 some odd years ago. You can probably maybe see, this is a map of Europe. And over here, this is where we landed up here in Scotland. And I had a, a friend of mine, a neighbor where we were living in North Jersey at the time, who was an amateur cartographer, make this up from my records. And we landed up here in Scotland and then came down to Cornwall, which is I think it's better if I, I wish I had a pointer. Here is Cornwall right here, Bude Cornwall on the Atlantic Ocean side of, 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 uh, of England. And then there are uh, lines drawn back and forth because we moved several, as I said, four or five times in England. And uh, the Isle of Wight is right here in the channel. And we would sit there at nighttime in the dark and watch the... Uh, German bombers fly over us because they were going up to bomb London, which was, as I remember correctly, 60 miles from Portsmouth and Southampton. And uh, they weren't going to drop their load of bombs on the Isle of Wight, so we would just sit there, stand there and look up and watch them go, and then they'd come back. But not all of them came back. And here are the lines to the invasion. Up here, the Cherbourg Peninsula. Then back down up to the Brittany Peninsula, where the city of Brest is. Then all the way across, here's Paris. We didn't stop at Paris. We went bypassed it. They were smart. They wouldn't let us out. We landed right here at the, uh, at the apex of Belgium, France, and Luxembourg. And we eventually, we fought in... Uh, I have to tell this about a little incident. We were landed in the town of Arlon in Belgium, A-R-L-O-N. Just uh, the war had bypassed uh, uh, us at that time. And uh, we were in a, uh, again in a training site. And Arlon is a beautiful, a uh, little larger than a town. Maybe not, maybe you can't even turn into a small city. And on... Uh, when we weren't training on a Saturday or Sunday, we even had a weekend off, I, I think, at one time there. The men walked into Arlon and managed to buy ice cream cones, which was unheard of. Then we fought in Luxembourg. You've heard of the Duchy of Luxembourg, but we fought there. Then we fought in Belgium. Across the Rhine River here, and all the way over here, and then here, outside of the city of Liège, of uh, Holly and Leipzig, not Liège, Holly and Leipzig, where the 69th Infantry Division met the Ru met the uh, the Russians. The war was over for them, but they put us on trucks, and we rode south to the town of Wieden, W-E-I-D-E-N got off the trucks, and they said, head east. And we started going east. We crossed the border into Czechoslovakia. And by the end of the war, two weeks later, we were fighting on the outskirts of, Czechoslov of Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. Now, we weren't at war with Pilsen, but nobody told us to stop. 
So we just kept going. Now the last few days, uh, combat was really sporadic, and everybody was. Rumors were rife that there was uh, uh, peace was imminent, surrender was imminent. So we went along cautiously. No one wanted to make headlines of the last man killed in World War II. So finally, on May 8th, the word came down, stop. And that was the end of the war for us. We pulled back to the estate of the former Czechoslovakian ambassador to the United States. I have pictures at home of the manor house in which he lived. This was about eight or ten miles outside of the city of Pilsen. And we encamped on his estate. Men pitched pup tents. And we went, the army didn't know what to do with us, so we went right through basic training just as if we had never been in a war. And we figured at some time we are going to be shipped over to Japan because the war in the Pacific had not, had not ended as yet. And we just stayed there until uh, September, now from May until September, just doing things to keep us busy. Before, towards the uh, September, then we started our long trek back to Reims in France, then to uh, the port of La Havre, where they had uh, a number of uh, camps that they called after cigarettes. Camp Lucky Strike, Camp Campbell, Camel, Marlboro, until we were waiting for a ship to get back to the United States. So it was the end of October before we arrived back at a temporary camp in uh, uh, Camp Patrick Henry down in uh, uh, Newport News, Virginia area, which was a temporary camp to, uh, to, set, it, to uh, set up just for the returning uh, troops. And as we walked off the, uh, uh, we came back as a unit. Our battalion commander thought it would be great to go back as a unit. Going back as a unit didn't mean a darn thing. <coughs> Excuse me, because when we came back to the, uh, when we got off the ship, there was a Red Cross and all these volunteers handing everybody a half pint carton of milk. Now, this was the first fresh milk we had had in, since we left, last left the States, I guess, although we had the French people at times, just as they uh, milked the cows on some of the roads where the shells uh, landing all around, they stood on the road and were handing out fresh milk to us. But we landed there, and overnight, we stayed there, and they broke up the, uh, that's where we would, the second range of battalion was disbanded. And every man was sent back to the army post where he entered the service. For example, I ended service from Fort Dix. I was sent back to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, that, and took, uh, it took a couple of days at Fort Dix before they finally uh, separated everybody, and as I recall, getting a uh, sale. I was a citizen soldier. I had no interest in the reserves. And they were giving me a, a sales talk about uh, uh, staying in the reserves, and I wanted out. And that's what I did. Now, Here is a landing schedule, and you can't see from there, but uh, this shows exactly where each wave was sent in. Here's a little larger with the beach. Here's C Company, the second range of Italian, right here. This Charlie beach. We were the only ones that went in. Nobody went in ahead of us. Nobody came in after. Ours was a separate mission. The main invasion force came in. Here, 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 and here. Then the British were over here. Is that Omaha? Or Omaha. It's all Omaha. U.S. Beach is Omaha. Here is, a, uh, is another part, and I have put on here where each company landed of the second range of battalion. Now, any questions? I'll do my best to uh, Paul. 
Well, there was a, uh, an automatic weapons position up on top, and there was a fort at what they, uh, what they termed a fortified house, which was a brick house. Now, when we got there, that fortified house, it's not intact anymore, but the brickwork is still there. And what that was, they, intelligence said it was a fortified house. When we got there, it was where the German troops in that area were quartered. So I guess it was a fortified house because they had their weapons there. They were, because they had, remember they had five years to build up the defenses all along the uh, post there. And that's what they had done, they dug that uh, trench. And there was a dugout, the du first dugout I came across. There was a, they took a kitchen, a wooden kitchen uh, table from some farm, fresh uh, French farmhouse with a couple of wooden chairs. And there was a steel locker. It was like going into a locker room, except this was an old battered locker. And that's where the German troops who, was on, who were on patrol, on post, that's where they stayed. And then when we walked up further, it was like a great big manhole. And that's where they had this heavy mortar, an 80 millimeter, 80, uh, Germans called it 80 millimeter mortar. We call them 81s for the heavy mortars. That was embedded in concrete. And around the walls were the targets up on the, up on the beach at Viraville with stakes on the beach, numbered one through, let's say, 10 or 12. And the, and the, ray, the, uh, the calibration for, the, for those numbers were painted on the wall. So all they, they had all pre-targeted it. And that's what they sent in. Now, if, uh, that was our mission, the fortif neutralize the fortified house. Actually, our mission was to go in there, fortify the house, take over the ground, and get to uh, the town of uh, Isigny. I call it Isigny. I guess they call it Iceni. It's I-S-I-G-N-Y. That's about 15 miles inland. It took us a, a week to get to that town. That was our mission. Why did they pick up grappling hooks the books? Well, we didn't have grappling cook cooks where we were. They didn't think we needed them. We were special. They had grappling uh, hooks at the Point de Hoc. And we had, we had two experiments, the DENF companies that were there. First, let me talk about those, and I'll tell you about what C Company did in climbing the cliff. DENF, we borrowed a, fire, a ladder from the London Fire Department, and they put that on a duck. D-U-K-W. Well, that looked good on paper. But the battleship Texas had been, and the Air Force had been firing, and the battleship Texas had been firing prior to the, uh, uh, the night before. They had been firing their 14-inch guns at Point de Hoc, and the shell holes were as deep as uh, this room here from sealing the floor. And half, and not half the cliff, a good part of the cliff where D, E, and F were landing had crumbled down, and the ducks couldn't get, eat, couldn't get close enough to land. So the, the ladders were a, uh, were a waste. Now, if you go back to one of the faults, I, I try to go to see every uh, war movie. If you go back to The Longest Day, which is way back in... Uh, they had the, uh, the ladder going up and one of the men up on top of the uh, ladder firing a machine gun. The ladder never got up there. Now, they also had, they experimented with a rocket. It was a, char was a charge of dynamite and it was in the, uh, uh, fitted in the, uh, in the stern of the, uh, of the landing craft. Remember, we went in with the British Navy, not the American Navy. So we had a different kind of landing craft than the so-called Higgins boat. I'm thoroughly satisfied with the British Navy. We had practiced with the American Navy when we were down in Fort Pierce, Florida. And uh, so I've seen the two of them, and I've been in two of them, and I preferred the uh, British uh, uh, idea of a landing craft. Matter of fact, uh, a week ago, I received a phone call, it was at noontime, uh, and I was just getting ready to eat lunch, and the phone rang, and it was a BBC, 
calling from London. A reporter introduced herself to me, and she said, well, you've, you've been given the, the name, and I've uh, managed to get a hold of you. And she said, do you mind if I, uh, if I take this conversation? And she was asking me about the, uh, I said, no, not at all. So uh, she interviewed me for about 15, 20 minutes on the phone and were asking me about the, uh, uh, the landing craft that we used because she said they, uh, some of the English uh, seamen who were uh, in their landing uh, forces were a little annoyed, particularly with Saving Private Ryan just opened up there this, this year in England. And uh, uh, she said the, uh, the British se seamen who were in the landing portion were annoyed because there wasn't enough emphasis given to the, uh, uh, to the landing craft because in the film there were American landing craft used. The British landing craft were entire, not entirely different, but they are different from, uh, uh, from the American. Now, I can explain it. The, uh, the British landing craft, there was a wooden bench on either side from bow to stern on the side. So the men that's sitting there, they sat with their backs to the, uh, uh, to the side of the, uh, of the landing craft facing each other. Then down the center of the, uh, of the uh, landing craft was a wooden bench, like a picnic bench. There the men straddled that, facing forward. Now we were cramped. And an interesting uh, example is the fact that uh, in all of our practice on land prior to the invasion of getting off the Prince Charles and getting into the landing craft and then going on shore, we, we always had our weapons, but we never had all the, this is a laugh, this is how even minor details, a lot of detail work was done in this planning but nobody figured out, gave us all, on all the three occasions, I think, when we pra did a, a practice. We never had all the ammunition we were going to carry or the ration. So as on the uh, Prince Charles, when we got off the Prince Charles into the landing craft and got down, I was the last man off over the uh, plank letting the other men go. And then when I got in there and walked up to the bow, there wasn't any room to sit. So I, I felt like a strap hanger on, on a subway, because I stood up all the way in. I'm the first man off. We don't pull rank in the, uh, in the Rangers. The, uh, there wasn't enough room for me to sit down, because we were so low down, for example, I'm a big guy, so I, I carried more ammunition than I probably needed. Plus, I carried one 60 millimeter mortar shell because our kitchen, and our kitchen and supply truck were not going to come in for five, at minimum of five days to seven days. So I carried everything I could. And we had K rations and what we call D bars, which are like a Hershey bar except only three, uh, three one inch squares. And uh, the, uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Uh, uh, so I had, I had my 60 millimeter mortar shell under my arm. My tom I carried a Tommy gun. I had the uh, stock cut off. So I just had a little two inch square piece of wood at the end of it on which I could hook the end of my uh, sling. And I figured with uh, what I'm going to shoot, I'm not going to be aiming at anybody. All I'm going to do is take it out and, like the uh, gangsters of the 30s, <laughs> except we didn't spray them. I had to carry all that ammunition. But when I, uh, when I jumped up after being hit on the, uh, uh, on the beach, and I knew all my mortar men were either killed or wounded, I figured the heck with my 60 million mortar shell, so I dropped it right there and went on. No sense carrying that without a mortar to fire. And, uh, well, I got off the point. Uh, is that the answer to uh, yes. part of your question? How did you get grappling hooks? You didn't have 
I, we didn't have any in C Company. Uh, I have, uh, my fingers are infected right now with a fungus infection from climbing up and digging foxholes with my fingers. We climbed up the cliff like that. Every other man had a six foot piece of rope around their waist with a loop on one end. And theoretically, every man was to, you get up, and we had, in all our practice climbing, we had a couple of men who were like uh, monkeys. And they were the ones who were going to go up first. Well, in theory, it all worked out. But in actuality, it didn't, because there might be two men now who made it, and one didn't have a loop on the end of his uh, rope. So they, were, they weren't any, any worthwhile at all. We climbed up there and did well. Up at the Point de Hoc, there's a grappling hook still up there as of this day, as five years ago when I was there the last time. It's still up on top there, rusting. Years ago, excuse me, yeah, OK, go ahead, I'll wait, Colin. What was the difference between the HQRS company? That's headquarters company. Now, we have six line, co I, OK, I should explain that. We have six line companies in a range of battalion. Headquarters company is the, they have the intelligence, the kitchens, the ammo, quarter, the supply, the uh, communications, and what, what ha the aid men, for example. Every aid, aid man is from the medical section of headquarters company. But he's on loan on, uh, in combat to a particular rifle, to a particular company. And we always had the same aid man. Even they got killed or wounded. So that six, those headquarters men were killed. Our radio man, for example, was killed on the invasion. The, and we didn't have any communication. Nobody had any communication at any one of the six companies. Because either the, the, either the men were killed or the, uh, or the radios went into the English Channel. Uh, at Point de Hoc, our communications officer made the landing up there. And he's a former employee of AT&T, and he knew uh, communications. And he managed, he had the foresight to bring a lantern in. And he had it worked, rigged up his lamp, lantern. All the radio men were killed, or the, or the uh, radios were uh, soaked with uh, salt water. So he rigged up a, uh, uh, a lantern, a signal lantern, and was signaling out to the, uh, where General Bradley was on the, I think it was the Ancon, was his flagship. And he Morse code out there with the, uh, with the signal lamp. Headquarters is headquarters company. What kind of weapons were the Rangers carrying at that time? Or the M1s, M1s, all M1s. The, uh, Oh, every, uh, every platoon had a flamethrower. And uh, I carried a Tommy gun. A, a one man, a, what we call the sniper in each platoon, he carried an 03. Remember, this is World War II. Everyone ca all the other men carried an M1. And uh, later on, uh, I'm going to say six months into the war, then what they call the uh, so-called grease gun type style of the, to of the Tommy gun came out. Well, that, that, they called it a grease gun because it's just like a service station before the modern ones of today, service stations of that era, where you had a grease gun and you got underneath a car and that's the way you lubed it. But those grease ones were absolutely, you bend them. Or I had a gangster style <laughs> Tommy gun. No, no. And I knew what I was going to fire. I'm not aiming at 400 yards away. My, we're close fighting. No. We're too busy. We're, actually, what happened? The way we worked, when we got up to the base of the cliff, the first thing, the first thing to do was just the opposite of, of uh, if you saw the uh, film Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks, he's sitting in the middle of a boat. OK, he's a company commander. He's sitting in the land, middle of a landing craft. And the men are all crouched on around the other uh, 
in the water there, whether they're hit or not, and they're crouched there and uh, calling mother and uh, everything else, and behind the uh, beach obstacles. We didn't have any beach obstacles where we landed because that was in front of the cliff. We just had to run across. Uh, uh, it was low tide. I would say, oh, good 75 yards, 50 to 75 yards of beach. And the, and the Germans never figured anybody's going to be dumb enough to come in there. They're going to come in under the beach. If you can imagine, <coughs> excuse me, walking along the boardwalk in Atlantic City or, or any shore area where the boardwalk is, and walking along there or just standing there and looking out to the ocean, that's what it must have been like where we, land, where we landed and where the main invasion force landed, where A and B landed and the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Division and the 1st Division. It was just like that. They ran across 75, maybe 100 yards of, of sand, just as if they're walking to the boardwalk. In front of this little town of Vereville, there's a roadway where the, uh, now it's a nice blacktop roadway because that's a tourist area now. But then there was a seawall there just the way it's in Private Ryan. The, uh, and uh, now they didn't have, there's still a hill there, I call it a hillock, but not a cliff the way we climb where uh, Sam Hanks and his men uh, climbed up there. That was just a, uh, what, what I would call a, a hillock. We climbed a cliff, D, E, and F climbed a cliff. That was five miles to our right, D, E, and F. And, uh, uh, it's absolutely flat there. As I say, it's just as if you were walking along the boardwalk in Atlantic City and looking out to the ocean and seeing the surf. But can you imagine, instead of seeing bathing, bathers out there, soldiers running across the, uh, uh, running across the sand? They weren't firing. They didn't have a chance to fire. I'm going to be there on May 6th. Oh. I'm going to, I'm leaving. June 3rd. Can you go down to the beach? Yes. 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 As a matter of fact, there's a path up there now. If you go to Vereville there, there's a ho called the Hotel du Casino. It's only a overgrown bar. And uh, that's right at the, what we call the exit at Vereville. The road comes down and curves and parallels the coast. And there are some beautiful homes along there. And uh, the, uh, in fact, there's a plaque on the wall there. And we put it up, uh, fifth range, some of the fellows from the fifth range of battalion put it up there uh, about 10 years ago. I was over there on that time. And we stood there and had our picture taken with the plaque set in the wall. And Yes, you can, there are paths up there now. In uh, 1979, when I was president of the Ranger Battalion Association, we were up at Point de Hoc, and I said, someday, this is going to be the Gettysburg of Europe. It was not just before that. Uh, 1965. For example, in 1961 to 1965, my family on our vacation, we followed our, the Civil War tra trail on our vacation with all the kids. So they were all good in history. And we'd stop it. We went all the way down through uh, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, the Carolinas, into Kentucky. And wherever we saw a marker, we'd stop the car and I'd get out, my wife and I'd get out and read the uh, the marker and the kids would say, oh, again? <laughs> but now they know, they remember that. And uh, in 19, this is 1961 to 1965, the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. And I remember in the paper, it was uh, the uh, National uh, Park Service at uh, Gettysburg were hoping they were going to get the, their two, I think it was a two millionth visitor at Gettysburg in, in 1990, 94, the 50th anniversary, the two million visitor was at uh, Point de Hoc and the 
uh, the uh, cemetery at Saint Laurent, the military cemetery, in 50 years. But that's different. It's a different war. And there are people from all over the globe. Here was just the United States. Yeah, way back. Welcome. Yes. It was overnight. Yes, yes. Uh, he and I, we went along those beaches, we saw those beaches, and we came to Omaha Beach. We visited the American cemetery, mm -hmm. which, as you know, and anyone else who's visited, is a Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, may, I, may I add a, a little bit more to what you were saying? I've been, w I've been back to Bude, and I, for the life of me, I couldn't remember, I couldn't pick out the house where I lived. But the people there where we lived, Bill Moody and myself were in the same house. And we were in one, both of us were in one, one of their rooms. And they couldn't have been better. They couldn't have treated us any better. Here we're, as I said before, can you imagine a, a soldier from a foreign country living in your home? When we'd go out on a night problem and we'd come back home and they had a thermos bottle of hot chocolate for us after we got in at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning on a night problem. And boy, that felt good. And we were gentlemen then, I'll have to say that. When we went back, they welcomed us with open arms. And uh, this was in 1990, I think it was. And uh, the, the town fathers had a, a big procession for us. But in, in December, at Christmas time, after we had been there for, uh, for a month, we pulled our American soldiers at that time were getting a uh, a candy ration and uh, cigarettes, chewing gum, and chocolate. For, for the month of December, we pulled it all together. And we had, a party, we had a Christmas party in the afternoon at the local cinema for all the kids in town. And that's where we, when we pulled that, those cigarettes and chocolates, we passed that out to the kids. Some of those kids had, had never, not the cigarettes, I never smoked, so uh, I always was the one who gave my cigarettes to some of my men. Those, some of those kids had never had a piece of chocolate because they were that young during the war. So we, we, I always think we were not the ugly American in, uh, in view. That was one of the things we did. And I correspond. <laughs> 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 
Well, I, I must say, when I said overnight ride, I, I can't remember when we got on the train. Maybe it was, uh, I don't know, maybe late in the afternoon, but it was still the next morning. And that didn't stop. And I was, uh, you, had, you, you had to put your, uh, the curtains down on blackout. So when we get, went through a station, I'd find, because the train would slow down, and I was a smart guy, so I would lift up the curtain and see if I could see the name on the station to see where the heck we were or where we're going. Somebody else had theirs. Okay, here, I, I, had, I was thinking of that, and I should have said it. When we first got there, everybody ran across the beach to the, to the base of the cliff, because the Germans were up on top. And uh, all they were doing was standing up on top and dropping uh, potato mashers, which they called hand grenades. They looked like an old wooden potato masher. And they were dropping those down on us. So as, the two, as it was time for the first two men to start up, I said, OK, everybody else down at the bottom, point your uh, weapons up and fire up there. And that drove the Germans back. That's how we got up. But they were up on top, and they were just dropping them down. That's all. How many men did you have at that point? Fire back if you lost it. Oh, I, I didn't count then. I wasn't in the mood for counting. It was when I got up on top. I wanted to see who was with me. All I did when, when I got to the base of that cliff, uh, after the aid man put a couple of Band-Aids on me or patched up whatever he did, and uh, I looked out, I looked back on the uh, on the beach, and here here all their bodies there, and the guys were seriously wounded. You could see their. Uh, uh, I, I thought I wrote a vivid story. With, uh, Yankee Magazine up in New England uh, accepted my story, and I got a nice check from them. And that, that must be, oh, 18, 15, 18 years ago or more. And uh, I, I know I wrote something pretty graphic. I said I was standing there and watching the pain-ridden face of the men who were seriously wounded as they tried to crawl up further up the sand to the cliff. You can't imagine it now. Saving Private Ryan, you didn't see many of the men crawling. They were just lying there and screaming and calling out. The men who were going to live, if they were able to, they got the heck off that beach. They got to the cliff. Yeah, Paul. There were a lot of men lost. Uh, it was a pretty good tide there, isn't it? Oh, there were a lot of, you bet. Like a tide coming in Atlantic City. No, it's, it's 50. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of my men was, uh, Eddie Harding, was son of a minister, and he was missing in action. Well, I know his body was just swept out to sea. He was killed instantly. I think he was 17 or 18 years old. But he was swept out to sea, and I didn't know it until the first time I went there, and he was listed as missing in action. We saw him killed and because that tide came up. In our area, we were in such an isolated area. A week later, uh, our adjutant came, o came up to me, went to each company uh, commander. I was, Ralph had still, I was B Company at that time. And he said, said where is Bill Moody? He's still, he's listed missing in action. I said, he was killed right next to me. And I said, I know right where he is. So we got in a Jeep, and we went back to the uh, to Pointe de la Perse area. And there, Bill was lying right where he'd been killed. Gray's registration hadn't gotten up there because the, uh, we were in an isolated area. Gray's registration was busy enough at the beach at Vereville where the 1st and the 29th Division came in. They probably didn't even know that we had come in there. He was lying right where he was killed. I'd say about 90 feet high, about 90 feet high. That's what, nine stories, nine stories high? And the cliffs that point to Hawk were probably a little higher. 
and uh, probably 100 feet high and probably just a little bit steeper. That's why they had a different approach. But uh, they, had, they had different problems that we did. Their landing was, was much easier except for the, uh, for the part of the cliff that had been knocked down by the Air Force, our own Air Force, and the 14-inch guns of the, uh, of the battleship Texas, which had been offshore, firing round after round after round of that. And the, uh, the, the, uh, some of those, uh, a couple of positions up there, one, only one is intact. And that's the famous one where when, uh, when uh, Reagan was president, he was over there, that uh, made all the, news, uh, all the news stories and photographs. He, he and uh, Mrs. Reagan are standing down there and looking through a, uh, uh, a slit, and you can just see him. That's the only one that's intact. All the others, and you can, see, and you can get in there. Of course, it's dank and damp down on the bottom there. But it, uh, all the others are partially, partially if not totally destroyed. And uh, uh, you can see the, uh, it's five years to pour concrete. I would say the concrete walls and, uh, and ceilings, four feet thick of concrete, steel reinforced concrete. And that's what Rommel did, uh, General Rommel, the, Engl the German commander, when he was transferred from Africa up to the, uh, as Hitler had him up there to, he was up there and he was appalled at the lack of, uh, of defenses up there. So he was the one that was instrumental on getting these uh, uh, bunkers in there. There's one right at uh, Beerville, and it's still there, and the French 75, was in that one. They had captured a French 75, and that was in there. Was it's halfway, uh, uh, halfway up the high ground there, pointed right out to sea. They never fired it though. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it, as I say, there were there were two destroyers that I know. The Satterley and the Harding were out off us. I thought they were going to run aground. They were that close. And uh, yeah, I, I can't say enough about the. Uh, the American Navy for the, uh, uh, for the offshore protection that they gave us along the entire Allied front. And you can't imagine, when we got out to, uh, to the Prince Charles the first time, you can't imagine the number of ships that you could see that were visible. How in the world could the Germans not know with all the spies they had over there? You can't imagine. You can almost. Did you ever see them uh, shad fishing up here at, uh, on the Delaware in the springtime? You can walk across from, jump from shad boat up Frenchtown to Lambertville. You can almost jump from uh, boat to boat across the. Uh, the you can't imagine the, uh, the sight in the English Channel with the number of boats that are out there. Absolutely unbelievable. Never see that again. I don't, not in my lifetime, anyway. Did the Rangers become the Green Berets? Or is that the Green Berets came after us. I know, but did, did the Rangers did become that? Or no. Disbanded the, the Rangers? Re, Green Berets were disbanded, too. They were, they were uh, maybe not disbanded. They were uh, soft-pedaled. And the Rangers started up again. And the first one was started up in, uh, uh, down in Georgia. Uh, no, not Fort Benning. The Ranger School is at Fort Benning. And uh, 1974, at Augusta, at a camp just out of, out of Augusta. Gordon. Camp Gordon, right outside of Augusta. And, then they, and it's still there in existence today. And then there's another one down in Florida, Eglin Air Force Base. That's where the rudder camp, they named that the rudder camp. That's the jungle camp. And then there's another one up in the mountains of Georgia. So it, uh, it's entirely different. The uh, uh, there wasn't any uh, wasn't any ranger training when uh, when I joined the rangers. We had to do it. I was a second lieutenant when I joined the rangers. When I volunteered for the rangers, and uh, we had uh, we'd stay up the night before figuring what we we're going to do tomorrow morning for training, and we we did it off the seat of our pants because the army didn't have anything. So it uh, and that's why. 
when we got into combat, we were attached to some divisions. They didn't know what they were getting. One time, uh, we're still in France, and uh, we were too high right after, uh, right after St. Lo. And uh, I, had, uh, I had one platoon on one high ground and another platoon on another high ground. And a, uh, a major from a, uh, uh, a division came over and he introduced himself and he said, uh, Captain, I'm here to relieve you. I, he said, where's your battalion? He thought I was a battalion commander. He had a battalion there. Well, I said, I'm, I'm a company commander. I have one platoon over there and another platoon over here. And he shook my hand. He, he couldn't imagine that. Because they didn't have any idea what a, uh, what a ranger battalion was. Anything else? Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Well, in '79, General Bradley and myself were the speakers at the at Point de Hoc. I have pictures. He was in a wheelchair then. Joe, there's a picture there of standing my standing next to. Uh, uh, General, no, next one, next. Uh, another one. There, to your row, up above that one by the cemetery. I'm standing next to uh, General Bradley. He's in his wheelchair, and we were the two speakers. Seven yeah, all the, uh, in fact, they're stand, all those officers are standing behind me. We had just placed a wreath at, in the, uh, the military cemetery. And I, uh, well, I think that's a moving experience. Uh, as I say, I go there every time, and I have the location of some of my men. And there's another picture of me saluting Lieutenant Price. And uh, I correspond with his brother, who lives in Roanoke, Virginia. And a friend, uh, friend he, he wrote and told me, of the, uh, there was an article in the Doylestown Intelligencer about me. And uh, it ha he said, I, I, in the article, I mentioned to the reporter, Steve Wartenberg, that uh, Lieutenant Price, I go and salute his grave marker every time. There's a picture there in 1994, prior to the 50th anniversary. I went over, I went to Europe twice within, within a month. I went over to make a commercial for AT&T, then I went over the following month for the June 6th. And uh, I'm stand there's the picture in there. I'm standing saluting in front of uh, Lieutenant Bob Bryce's uh, uh, grave site. He was killed instantly in, uh, in his landing craft in B Company. And uh, I was telling Joe before that uh, all of a sudden a golf cart came up the, uh, came up the grass, the, uh, uh, the gravel path there. And the young lady s stepped out. And there were two, two men in the uh, golf cart. And she came up to me and she introduced herself. I forget her name. She said, I'm with CBS. And she said, I want to know who you were. Well, I had my jacket on. I wear this when I go over to Normandy. And she said, I see who you are. Who are you? And I told her. And I said, I'm saluting. I do this. I said, this is one of my friends who was killed on June 6th. And she called the two fellows out, who was a cameraman and the sound man. And she interviewed me right then and there. That's before Spielberg put it in his uh, Saving Private Ryan that the, the, uh, the film opened in the, in the cemetery and closed in the cemetery. I, I've done that for years. Oh, Ranger, that's RBA, Ranger Battalion Association. This is one that we made up after, after the war when we formed the Ranger Battalion Association. This is the patch we wore on our left shoulder. 
but I'm peacetime and I wear it here. I took the, uh, there's, I wrote to, uh, to Tom Hanks after I, I was invited to a private screening prior to the general release. And I took my, uh, my oldest son with me. And I hadn't read too much about it. So we're sitting there and when Tom Hanks goes up and he said, Captain Miller, C Company Second Race, I sat up in my seat. And uh, when I wrote to uh, Tom Hanks, I listed all the, uh, Oh, about six different errors that I saw. Well, I realize it is not a documentary. Saving Private Ryan is uh, entertainment, if you want to call it that. It's a movie. Made, it was, it's a made-for-profit. It's not a documentary. I told him in my, uh, uh, first of all, he had the old, what we call a Sunico patch on, which is Rangers. I have a, down to my last two at home. And I said, we didn't wear a ranger patch. When we're in the marshalling area, we talk off the ranger patch. It was just like telling the, telling the Germans, hey, here's a good mark. Get me. As soon as we saw an SS guy, man, he was a target for us. So we took off our ranger patches after that. On, uh, on my steel helmet, some men, uh, you see some pictures, they've got their uh, bars or their captain's bars or the colonel's or whatever in front. Not me. As soon as I got a, soon I muddied it up. Then when we got on shore in combat, I picked up some uh, uh, parachute cam camouflage, and I always wore that over my steel hat. My men knew who I was. I didn't have to have officer on me. That was only making me a target for an enemy. And then another, another, another uh, item I pointed out, the men wore leggings in the picture Saving Private Ryan. We didn't wear leggings, we wore jump boots. Well, I suppose they couldn't get jump boots uh, for the uh, picture. Another error, I never saw them, that patrol that he took, I never saw them get a resupply of ammunition or, or more rations. They never stopped to eat. So there, there are two more errors. Then they just stroll along. <laughs> He's leading. He's in the middle of the men, and they're just strolling along. I never had a philosophical discussion when I was on a patrol. <laughs> and when we were walking across a, a field, there were all hedgerows all around there anyway, hedgerows that were so thick you couldn't see through them. And we ran across, and we were careful. You couldn't spot a mine all the time, but we didn't get up and run until we found a place where we could run that had a little cover. It might only be a small depression in the ground, but any depression is, uh, is protection. So we'd get up and run and, man, hit the ground and look around again for the next place. We didn't get up and walk until we found out where we were going. Anything else? Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciated that. Sydney on the cover of uh, Rowing Magazine.